What if simply asking a question changed the course of your life? I'm Ella Lauser, as has been told to you, and I have been running a web-based advice column for quite some time. But my journey has really been for these last 12 years. I've answered thousands of thousands of emails, questions, phone calls at strange hours. Um, and what I've ultimately been completely dedicated to and honored to be is a space for asking those questions to give people the opportunity to reflect on what's really true for them. And I'm standing here before you today because I had the audacity <laughs> to continue to be curious, even when things got uncomfortable, as they often do. And so it's in asking those questions, I really believe, and I think so many of us would agree in this room and in the world, that we can uncover our beliefs, our definitions, and the meanings that we make of our world. Because at those moments where we stand and we're not sure of ourselves, or we're operating from a place that hasn't been uncovered and investigated, we feel alone. We feel disconnected. We certainly don't feel celebrated. And it's in my work and in my hope that in just changing with one question, one conversation, that we can feel inspired, we can feel excited, we can feel empowered, and ultimately, alive. So my journey began when I was about 11 or 12 years old. And like many people at that age, was really curious about when I'd be a woman. When does that happen exactly? When does it occur? Does it occur when I get my cycle? Is it when I finally get breasts, please? Um, is it when I have sex? Is it when I get married? Is it when I turn 18 or 21, 25, 30? When I give birth? So, of course, I began asking with my mom, and, um, who was a nurse, so I figured knew everything and had seen everything, life, death. And she didn't have an answer for me. I said, well, when did it happen to you? And she's like, I don't, I don't really recall. Well, when did you start your cycle? I don't really want to remember. <laughs> so I went to the elder of my family, my grandmother, who was fabulous and British and bisexual. I figured she'd have something fantastic to say. And she said, well, when I started my cycle, I was beat with a belt. That's kind of how it started. And I thought, how, how is this giant rite of passage just being skipped over or forgotten or stuffed in the bottom of a laundry bin? <laughs> is that really how we're starting? And is that really what we're teaching and what we're standing for? So I started asking these questions to those around me and to anyone who was willing to stand and have that conversation. Um, and my grand was fantastic as I moved forward and asking more and more um, because she had such a, a fun quality in how she wanted to talk and, and just really had great humor. So it took all of that space of, what is this, what is this, what is this, to, we're human, it's simple. <laughs> it's really not that complicated. And when I got to university, I had been on this quest for quite some time, but it was a question that my sociology professor posed on the first day of the course. Um, to everyone in the classroom, she had everyone take out a piece of paper and a pen. And she said, please define the following. And she wrote, what is sexual? And as everyone took a few minutes to write their sentence or their paragraph, I really didn't know how to start answering mine, and I'm normally not one for a loss of words, and I just thought, what, what is sexual? God, well, I, I'm really curious to hear what everybody else is going to say. I hope I get the right answer. So as everybody went around 
the room answering, and it was a lecture hall about this size, not one person had the same answer. Not one. And I thought, how is it if we're defining sexuality or what is sexual, how are we relating to one another and meeting each other at the same place and certainly feeling connected? Wow, this is fascinating. And it was by listening and not thinking that I had the answer that I was able to perceive of another way. And almost in a way of picking from a cafeteria, like, that tastes good, and I think that sounds about right, and slowly trying to find my own definition through reflection. And so it was after a bit of travel and graduating, I decided to devote my entire life for a year to teaching teens about, well, really starting the conversation of what is sexual. And teaching hundreds of students at age 13 or 14, I was immediately put back into that place of, when does it begin? When do I get the gold badge? When is, when, you know, I know the big question on a lot of them um, was, you know, when am I, when am I going to finally be someone worth listening to? They were really my teachers. And my favorite way to start the class, I'll share with you, is, was I would stand up in front of everyone. I said, okay, so everybody look around. Take a moment. If you're ever feeling uncomfortable, especially if we're going to be talking about this big word, sex and sexuality, um, just taking a look, yeah? Now, every person in this room, what do we have in common? Well, we're all the result of an orgasm. And their eyes would go back in the back of their heads and turn bright red, but they were listening which was the point of the task. <laughs> and, and they started, I could see the wheels turning in the back of their heads. Well, God, that's true. Okay, what else are you gonna say, sex ed teacher? And I thought, all right, let's go there. What is sexuality? No one wanted to raise their hands at first. So I put a little piece of paper on um, the projector and let some items appear behind me which said, what is sexuality? Well, the first three letters are just S-E-X, which is one aspect, but it's really just a small aspect of what sexuality is. And there's so many ways of expressing that, which could be defined as love, spirit, sensuality, as my grandmother always says. And I would discuss these items on this list of how to express sexuality. And I'd say, is there anything on this list that a three-year-old can't do? I'd always get a hand that would raise. Yeah, they can't masturbate. Well, maybe they would not be able to say masturbate. It's a big word. But how many people here have little ones in their lives that have found out that touching their body feels really good in different places, you know? And everybody's like, mm, yeah, OK. My brother does that. Yeah, that's great. Now, what about writing a love letter? And they're like, oh, no, a three-year-old can't write a love letter. Some of the most passionate love letters I've ever received in my life have come from a three-year-old, or even smaller. They're extremely colorful. I may not be able to read them, but I certainly feel them. And so they'd start to have this conversation continue in their head. And I take a minute and say, OK, so we got the three-year-old down a bit. Got it there. What about a 93-year-old? Is there anything on the list that a 93-year-old couldn't do? And very often, um, someone in the back would say, they can't dance. And I'd say, well, how many of you have been to a wedding? Uh, yeah. I still can't partner dance, but most 93-year-olds know how to. And they're quite the good at it. And they all laugh and say, oh, yes. Well, I guess that's true. And it was really just about reconsidering what is true. So it was from that point that I began to see that there was a conversation that was missing, where there was an askable adult in these children's lives, whereas I was very lucky to have that, and yet still there wasn't an answer. So I decided to create a website that devoted my time and my energy to that. I would get phone calls and emails, and it, it was a very entertaining first couple of years. And the question still went around in my head, well, when does it begin? You see, I believe that sexuality isn't just something that occurs with 
puberty, which is what most of, most of my teen students thought. They're like, oh, well, that's, that's when it begins. It's, you know, when you're able to do it. Right. Well, what if it's to be it? I believe that to be sexual is to be alive. Not just because we're, we're the result of an orgasm, but because we feel we are, we're this piece of magic that is beyond words. There's something alive in that moment between two people when they come in. And I thought, okay, if no one's had the answer yet, I'm gonna go to the beginning of where we all start. What better way to do that than to support birth? And I learned the word doula, which some of you may know. A doula is a woman of service in honoring the journey of a family, becoming one, helping them through their efforts in birth, birth and postpartum. And I was elated. I was so excited to finally be in the space where someone was actually going to invite me to be at a part of their life and the most beautiful transition and that opening of creating a whole new world. And my first birth <laughs> was miraculous and strange and complicated and just as life is. Um, when I arrived, I was informed that the mother was not dilated. Her water had broken and she had chosen to have a, a natural birth, but in a hospital setting. And when I got there, the doula I was assisting said, it's going to be a long night. And I thought, OK, I'll just show up and do what I can to be in service to this woman, to this moment, to really seeing what unfolds between two people and that moment where they go from woman and man into mother and father. And I get to see the first moment of this, of this human life that we live. And we went right to work busting at our toolkits, bouncing on balls, and going on walks, and singing songs, and talking to the baby. And it was beautiful. And um, there wasn't any progress. And she had hours counting down to the moment that she was going to be forced to go into the OR for the safe of safety of her child and herself. So it came down to the last two or three hours after 30 hours the mother was incredibly exhausted. She had taken on medications to help contractions and also medications to not feel the contractions as much because it got pretty severe. And I remember holding her leg and one of the final checks, the nurse came in and said, you know, you're fully dilated, you're ready to go, but the baby's not ready. The baby's not turning and the baby's not coming down. We're gonna have to go into the OR. And my heart just stopped. And um, I took a moment, I took a step back, and the nurse came in and held the mother's leg. And I remember stepping back to the room, and everything got really quiet. And I was listening to the, the fetal monitor of the baby, and it was struggling. And I thought, OK, what's the answer? I've been asking all these questions. What's the answer? How can I? How can I be enough, or how can I be this safe space? And I thought, what does she need to feel welcome here? And I racked my brain, and I racked my brain, and tried to use logic to every end that I could think. And it wasn't until I stopped thinking that I heard and I felt sing. <laughs> I'm not going to sing in the middle of a hospital. But I sang. Ire wera wera ni taoshun. Ire wera wera. Ire wera wera ni taoshun. Ire wera wera ni taia. Oshaki ni ba ni taoshun. Jake jake. And she turned, and she came down. 
And when that cord was cut and she was taken from her mother in that first moment, and I burst into tears, I didn't know that's really what eyes could do. I, I just, I didn't even know what to do or say, and she began to cry, and I, I sang again, and she instantly stopped crying. As if to let me know, <laughs> I heard you. And it was in that moment I really saw that it's not so much in having our logic in that quest of what's the answer, what's the answer, but taking a moment to feel what the answer is and the magic that we uniquely are, that we were brought here to do, that we may not know right away and certainly it could get uncomfortable before we feel it. But that's worth living for asking those questions, those big ones, and being curious and honoring the heart no matter what it tells you to do. Thank you so much. <laughs>